So hello everyone, my name is uh, Lucie Lavois and I'm a senior forester with the Atlantic Forestry Center. Bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle Lucie Lavois, je suis forestière principale pour le Centre de Foresterie de l'Atlantique. Donc avant de commencer, je vais seulement souligner quelques remarques d'ordre administratif. Before starting, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, as stated in the email invitation, today's presentation will be in English. The presentation slides in French and English and the recorded webinar will be sent to all participants by email next week. Tel qu'indiqué dans le courriel d'invitation, la présentation sera donnée en anglais, mais les diapositives de la présentation en français et en anglais, ainsi que l'enregistrement du webinaire, seront envoyés à tous les participants par courriel la semaine prochaine. Nous vous invitons à utiliser l'icône de questions et réponses sur le bas, la barre en bas de votre écran pour vous poser vos questions. Les questions peuvent être posées soit en anglais ou en français, mais nous allons attendre jusqu'à la fin de la présentation pour répondre aux questions. So we do ask that they use the Q&A button at the bottom and not the chat, please, so we can keep track of the questions and answer at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. So the question will be asked, maybe ask in English or in French, but we'll wait until after the presentations um, to answer the question. First, we would like to acknowledge that we do conduct our work activities on the treaty lands and territories of numerous and diverse Indigenous nations and do pay tribute to their heritage and legacy. We do aim to walk lightly, harvest with respect, and learn from local knowledge keepers in every nation. Thank you. Okay, so today we do have a great um, group of panelists on uh, experts on species at risk recovery. So our speakers today will be Dan Cross, Director of National Conservation Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, Nat Natalie Staffel from Fire and Vegetation Ecologists, with Mount Revolstoke and Glacier National Park and Parks Canada, Claire Wilson uh, O'Driscoll and Pam Mills, which are biologists for the province of Nova Scotia Natural Resources and Renewables Department, Matt Brophy, Seed and Cryobiology Technician with the National Tree Seed Center, Dr. Jenny McEwen, Assistant Professor, Department of Biological Science, University of Lethbridge, and Nita Hunt, botanist with GEI Consultant Limited and former Horticultural Research Technician with Dr. McHugh. Our panelists of experts today will each have 15 minutes uh, to do a presentation. And if you do have questions during the presentation, please submit in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. After we've heard from our speakers, we will take a short five minute break and we will open up the floor to uh, Q&A period. Um, so this webinar is part of our program to support the Two Billion Tree Program objectives. Uh, in 2023, we did hear um, in 2022 that sharing knowledge with Indigenous communities is important for reconciliation, conservation, and restoration. That many organizations need hands-on seed training to grow their capacity, but finding free time is challenging. And also, there was a poor seed to nil crops in Eastern Canada, but heavy in Western Canada. So be ready for reversal this season. Our past webinars are available on demand on YouTube in English, and the decks and Q&A written resources and research paper also available on request by emailing us. Just a quick note uh, for a few of you that signed up already that we may have to adjust and reconsider the May 16 uh, webinar due to the federal workers worker strike, so we'll uh, stay tuned on that. We will follow up with registrant from each webinar and our and National Tree Seed Center MailChimp newsletter subscription service is the best way to uh, hear from us in the near future and you can find that on our website. So we're here today to support a particular challenge within the Two Billion Tree Program, which is sourcing the right seed to grow trees for the right place. So this table is a list of species planted under the Two Billion Tree Program in 2021 that has been assessed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada as of October 2022. The National Tree Seed Center is here to support funded partners with achieving the, their objective, especially since many of these species are seed limited and challenging to grow. So our speakers will explain, um, as our speakers will explain, the Species at Risk Act is an important final in step in biodiversity conservation. So you can learn more about any of the existing recovery programs and regulations by, by looking up official documents published online in your jurisdiction, sometimes in both English and French. So please consult your local authorities and ecosystem stewards on seed collection, transfer, and propagation rules. Now we have uh, just two quick voluntary poll that we will help NTNC understand who is listening today and why. And we'll be using this inform information to inform the NTSC knowledge exchange and Indigenous Seed Collection Program priority and needs and sharing the impact on our webinars within the 2BT program. 
So the first question, I will launch the poll here. Are you currently involved in a GBT project? And if so, which stream? Êtes-vous actuellement impliqué dans un projet de GA et si oui, dans quel domaine? And if you scroll down, there's also a second question. Have you managed, sourced, or plant species at risk before? Avez-vous déjà géré, approvisionné, ou planté des espèces en péril? So while you answer these questions, uh, Melissa's going to put up a couple of photos. Um, we'll wait. Let's see? One of the photos of the DNA tested butternut from Ontario from 2012. AFC stats supported when the crop uh, succumbed to canker while within the seed um, from within the seed the following spring. And there's also an, an image of our successful prior storage experience with Magnolia last year. So Matt Brophy will be talking more about these species um, in his talk a little later on. Okay, so I do see 39 out of 55 that answer the question. I'll give me a couple more seconds and I will end the poll. And this is voluntary, so thank you for those who are answering. Okay, so I will end the poll now and I will share the results if you're curious to see. So for the most part, we have um, on the first question, 83% that attend, attending for other initiatives. And have you managed source or plant species at risk before? And yes, 63%. So thank you for, for that, providing that information. Okay, so it's time to hear from some of our panelists. I will not pass it on to Mary Knockwood. Um, Indigenous Program Coordinator with the Canadian Forest Service Atlantic Forestry Center. Hi, and thanks for having me. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the lands that I'm on. I'm on the Mi'kmaq unceded territories of Nova Scotia. Um, and I would also like to recognize all the diverse um, territories and treaties that are across Canada of all of the groups that we're working with. <laughs> So I'm um, here to kind of just kind of discuss a bit about the Indigenous perspective and the role of the ISCP Indigenous Seed Collections Program in conserving rare species. So the Indigenous Seed Collections Program is working with Indigenous partners to support the collection, processing and or storage of seeds of importance to them. This is of importance not only to the communities, but to the survival of all our species throughout Canada. As such, there needs to be a dedicated source of funding to support all of the required strategies of collections, processing, and or storage to do so. I feel that if we bring our minds together, I'm sure we will find a way to support all of these very important initiatives. So you'll see before you right now that um, these are pictures of black ash. Um, so this I'm using these particular this particular species as a way of showing how and the importance of uh, seed collections. Um, the black ash is on the protection list of um, many different um, provinces. Two that I know of for sure are Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Um, so they're, um, the reason they're being protected and they're on the species protection list is because of, as you see, the green bug in the middle of the screen, that is the emerald ash borer. And it is impacting black ash and its ability to reproduce. And black ash is a very significant species for Indigenous communities, as they use many of the Indigenous communities within the black ash um, territory, use it for making ash baskets uh, for making um, beautiful artwork and crafts within the indigenous communities. And in some places, black ash is gone completely. Um, and if seeds were not collected prior to their disappearance, then there may be issues on being able to retrieve um, that species and continue its uh, re introduction to that area without having to grab seeds or plants from other um, eco districts, which is something we're trying to avoid. We're trying to help and ensure that people have access to appropriate seeds for the appropriate place. Um, these three pictures show you some um, 
basketry um, and the one without like without a basket those are the actual splints from ash that's what it looks like um, so I think it's also important to realize that you know um, in Nova Scotia uh, we have just started seeing impacts uh, from the emerald ash borer within the last uh, Claire you're gonna have to re, um, correct me if I'm wrong but I believe it's the last 10 years or so next slide please and the reason I'm bringing this particular species up is because it's showing the significance of um, being proactive as opposed to reactive. And the Indigenous Sea Collections Program is working with um, many of the Indigenous communities across um, Canada trying to help gain their um, capacity, um, but not only them, but for us to learn from them as well as them to learn from us. Um, so hemlock here in the Atlantic is now being threatened by the hemlock woolly adelgid or HWA. And it's potentially the next major tree species to be put on the species protections list. This, the pictures you see before you, uh, you see a healthy hemlock, uh, you see a somewhat um, healthy hemlock stand. And then on the third uh, picture on the right, you'll see an impacted hemlock, which was impacted by hemlock woolly adelgid. The ISCP, the ISCP is working with several Indigenous groups and communities and organizations on seed collections for the hemlock in hopes of bringing them back or being able to access those seeds if the species is lost. It is important to realize that the Indigenous Seed Collections Program is also here to help um, learn from each other, um, to pass on lessons learned from each group to other groups, to become a networking um, opportunity for all groups um, between those all involved in Indigenous sea collections. We hope to ensure that in the future to always have a proactive response to species survival for our future generations. Lucy. Thank you, Mary. If you do have a question along, um, along the way, please put them in the Q&A, which is a gentle reminder. Now we will hear from Dan Krauss, Thank you, Lucy. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you just confirm you can see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Krause, Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Very happy to uh, give you a bit of context in terms of trees and tree conservation in, uh, in Canada. Uh, I live and work in a region, uh, it's a township formerly called Nasagawea. Uh, Nasagawea is just outside of Guelph and it's a Mississauga First Nation term for river with two outlets. And that's because where I live, the water drains into 16 Mile Creek into Lake Ontario. But when I walk my dog up the street, I can get into the Grand River watershed in uh, just a few hundred meters. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we created this State of Canada Trees report um, just a few months ago. It, uh, it came out and we did it in partnership with NatureServe Canada. Uh, if you're not familiar with NatureServe Canada, uh, they coordinate all of the conservation data centers that exist across the country uh, and had lots of experts from conservation data centers that helped to contribute um, to, this, to this report. Uh, if you haven't heard of Wildlife Conservation Society before, uh, we are one of the oldest sort of civil society groups involved in, in conservation uh, in North America. Um, originally established as a New York Zoological Society uh, and has grown to a, a global organization with country programs. And if you kind of look on this little brochure, I mean, the ob objects of the society, the middle one there is, you know, preservation of our native animals. And that was certainly what the society, one of the key things it was founded on was saving species like the bison. Now you might wonder why I'm showing you a picture of a bison for a webinar about trees, but I'll, I'll actually explain that in uh, later on in the, in the presentation. Uh, in Canada, um, we've actually, there's been programs going on for well over a hundred years. Um, WCS uh, published some of the first lists of endangered species and has done all kinds of surveys for different uh, rare and declining species and has also produced some films with the National Film Board of Canada way back in the 1940s about migratory birds and the, the plight of migratory birds and need for, for their conservation. Uh, we work across Canada. We have some field programs that are in the north focused on the boreal. We also have a cool western bats program that is aimed at um, slowing understanding the spread of white nose syndrome, which is sort of similar to some of the uh, invasive species that are affecting trees. 
Um, and then we have national programs as, as well that work across the country. Uh, one of those is the Shape of Nature program. Um, Shape stands for Species, Habitats, Actions, and Policy Evaluations. Uh, we just started this about a year ago as a way of kind of daylighting a lot of information on biodiversity and conservation and, and trying to make it in a, a format that's accessible and easy for people to, to understand. And around the new year, we're thinking, well, we've done all of these different uh, evaluations on things like species at risk and globally threatened ecosystems. You know, what, what's something else we can sort of add to our, um, our, our evaluations? And the idea came up that we should do something about trees. And that was recognizing that International Day of Forests was, was coming up in March. Uh, but also there was this global report that was done that I'm sure a few folks on the call have seen about the state of the world trees uh, that identified about 30% of, of trees are, are threatened. And we're thinking, well, what is the number in Canada? And really was not, not sure what it would be. Uh, we had some information to go by. We know that when you look at the different taxa assessed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, the scientific committee that does the assessments and makes recommendations um, for species to be listed under the Species at Risk Act, uh, most of them are, are plants. There's a, a large number that are plants. And also the wild species report um, for 2020 came out in 2022, uh, and it identified that about uh, one, one in five species are critically imperiled, imperiled, or, or vulnerable. Um, so again, the question was, well, what, what's that number going to be for trees? And there's lots of good reasons to uh, sort of get, get this information for trees. I mean, trees are very well known. Um, they're well documented. The public knows you know, what a tree is right away. And obviously trees have a lot of economic importance, a lot of cultural importance. And as a conservation scientist, I mean, I'm really interested in their importance for, for biodiversity. Um, and we know that when you lose a tree, you lose much more than, than a tree. You know, a great example is the, the loss of the American chestnut. Um, this is a species that was a dominant forest um, tree uh, in many ecosystems in Eastern North America. Uh, rapidly declined because of the introduction of the chestnut blight in, in 1904. And so we haven't lost the chestnut, but it, you know, certainly we've lost a lot of the chestnut trees that were there, but it, we've lost more than just, just that tree. You know, we lost this entire ecosystem. No one on the call today will ever experience what an American chestnut forest looked like, uh, sometimes described as a, the redwoods of, of Eastern North America, just massive trees. And uh, even in second growth, that lower photo, you know, critically important tree for, for wildlife in terms of the mast it would produce and the habitat it would provide. So we lose ecosystems, but we can also lose species. Um, there's many species that depended on the chestnut tree, directly dependent. Uh, and we know that there is at least three insects that were dependent on the, uh, the American chestnut tree, uh, the larger chestnut weevil, the chestnut longhorn beetle, and Reiner's minor bee um, that are likely ex extirpated from, from Canada because we lost the, the chestnut. So trees play this really important role in uh, ecosystem and species diversity. So the first question we had to solve, which was actually much more difficult than I thought, is what exactly is a tree? If we're gonna figure out how many are at risk, we needed to define uh, how many trees we had in Canada and which species we were, we were counting. So we, we included species, but we also included subspecies and, and varieties um, as well. And they had, they had to be native to Canada. And the definition we used was consistent with what was used in the, the global tree assessment. So trees at uh, at least two meters, um, typically they're not multi-stem, but if they are multi-stem, then there's one stem that's at least five centimeters diameter at, at breast height. Uh, we recognize this is conservative and you know, we were gonna risk maybe elevating some shrubs into, into trees, um, but we, we decided that we would we just make sure that everything that could be defined as a tree uh, would be included in our, in our assessment. Um, and, and also met that, that global definition of what, what a tree is. Uh, we then looked at the conservation status of all of the trees. So once we had our, our list of Canadian native trees that met that definition, uh, we looked at the, the International Union for Conservation Red List status. Uh, we looked at their, their status on CASIWIC, uh, Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And we also use NatureServe. NatureServe ranks both the global and the national rank of different species. So anything that, that was listed by Kosiwik that was on the IUCN red list um, as critically endangered, uh, endangered, vulnerable, but we also include near threatened as well. 
uh, or was listed nationally in, in sort of those categories of, of eight uh, to three was included as, as at risk. So what did we come up with? Well, we identified that there's uh, 234 native species of trees. Uh, we got that list by combining a whole bunch of different sources that out there, including NRCAN list, Trees Canada list, uh, Vast Can, uh, and NatureServe. Um, of those 234 species, uh, one in four is at risk. And that, that number actually surprised me. Before we actually ran the numbers, I thought maybe it's going to be one in eight, you know, maybe one in 10. Uh, but it is one, one in four. And, and maybe just as surprisingly, half of those species are also of global conservation concern. So they're, they're at risk in Canada, but they're also at risk globally. And a great example is a Kentucky coffee tree, uh, which is uh, ranked by NatureServe as, as N2, which is imperiled in Canada, uh, but it's also on the IUCN red list as a, a vulnerable species. And we mapped out where these trees occur. So they, we don't have any at-risk trees in Northwest Territories or, or Nunavut. We do have one in Yukon, uh, but then they do occur in, in every province. And not surprisingly, it's Ontario, Quebec, and BC have the highest number of at-risk trees. These are generally the provinces with the most at-risk species in, in general. Uh, but you can see Ontario especially really stands out. And actually, although it's one in four in Canada, Ontario is closer to, to one in two species, uh, has some level of risk. Uh, there were also some species that we included that were either extirpated or endemic. So extirpated meaning that they're, they once occurred here, but they're gone from Canada. Um, uh, a great example is, uh, is great laurel. Um, this species was known from Nova Scotia around Sheet Harbor in the 1870s. It was well known uh, by indigenous peoples. It's likely that logging and fire swept through this area and caused its extirpation from, from Canada. Now, apparently there is one planted at the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History, uh, but that the origin of that one is, is unknown. Uh, and then we had some endemic species as well. A lot of them were hawthorns, but did include this newly described species, um, which is a, a variety of lodgepole pine called the Yukon lodgepole pine. Uh, the right now is only known from, uh, from mountains in, in Yukon. We took our list of at threat of uh, at risk uh, trees and we, we identified what the key threats to them were um, using IUCN threat taxonomy. And not surprisingly, when you look at the, the top five threats, uh, habitat conversion, sometimes that's historical conversion, sometimes that's contemporary, was impacting about uh, almost half of the at-risk trees. Invasive species was critical for about a, a quarter. Um, natural system modifications, which was primarily fire suppression, was affecting almost one in four as well. Uh, forestry, not directly impacting them, but trees that could get cut sort of during forest operations was also um, about, about one in four. And then road maintenance for some was identified where they, they may actually get cut during, um, uh, during road maintenance activities. Um, other threats included climate change, especially for species out west, problematic native species. So for example, um, that would include like white-tailed deer over browsing on, on blue ash. Uh, just a note about invasive species, I mean, it's quite diverse. It includes things like, you know, Mary mentioned emerald ash borer. Um, so insects, but also diseases. And in some cases, even, um, invasive plants that can, uh, can affect regeneration. Um, and in one case with, uh, with red mulberry, it's the introduced white mulberry that, caused, that hybridizes, uh, which is a threat to that species. And now you might think, well, you know, Canada, like why are these trees threatened? Like we have so much forest and, you know, it is true in the North, you know, we have some of like the last big intact high integrity forest left in the world. But you look in Southern Canada and I mean, we've hit our forests as hard as, you know, any other country in the world. There's places in Southern Ontario where there's less forest cover than um, countries that are sort of the poster nation for uh, deforestation, uh, places like southwestern Ontario, where just a small portion of the forest is left. And that's where many of these at-risk tree species occur. Um, I, I want you to kind of think of these trees, though, in like two big groups. Um, it is related to the threats that are impacting them. The, the first one, there's sort of these small range or small population species. Um, so things like red mulberry that I mentioned or narrowleaf cottontail cottonwood of the, the prairies. Um, there's just not many of them. They live in small areas. Uh, but then we do have this other group like black ash or eastern hemlock that were mentioned. 
they, they still occur over large areas, can still be common, but they're rapidly, rapidly declining. And I think it's helpful to think of them in these two categories because the, the conservation strategies uh, that we need are very different for these two groups. Um, in terms of trees and uh, Canada Species at Risk Act, um, there's 16 that are currently listed under the Act. Um, that's only about 21% of the, the total number that we that we identified. Now, some of them may not actually would ever be assessed as at risk under under SARA. Things like pawpaw, which are, are rare, but they're generally secure and they, they likely wouldn't be assessed. But there are quite a few that are of national and global conservation concern that likely would, would qualify as species at risk if they were assessed uh, by, by Kasiwik. So quick quiz. So I want you to think about have there actually been any trees that have improved in conservation status in Canada? So kind of moved from you know special concern or from endangered to special concern or actually been taken off the list? Uh, and the answer might surprise you just kind of, you know, as a, a little clue, when you look at species that have actually genuinely recovered, so not because we found more, but because there were conservation actions um, that led to the recovery, there's really not even that many plants. There's only four. Uh, that have been listed by Kasiwik and then downlisted or taken off the list for, for genuine uh, reasons. And none of them are trees, which is kind of surprising because, you know, there's these big charismatic um, wildlife that's all around us, well known, and we actually have not sort of bumped the conservation status of any of them uh, into, a better, into a better category. And this is even more surprising when you think about kind of this long history that we have with, with trees. Next year marks the 400th anniversary of the, the publication of this book, Silva, uh, A Discourse of Forest Trees and the Propagation of Timber in His Majesty's Domains. So we've been thinking about, you know, regenerating trees for a long time. Algonquin Park was established, you know, thinking about forests and forest conservation. We've had the U of T forestry since, since 1907. You know, so why haven't we recovered more trees? And the answer going back to the bison is that's because most of our species efforts have been focused on mammals and birds. You know, going back well over 150 years, that was the, that was the focus. It was these, these two uh, uh, groups of species. And really plant conservation, thinking about conservation of, of species of plants didn't really kick into high gear uh, into the, the 1970s. Um, folks like um, George Argus, uh, from the Canadian Museum of Nature, or Edward Isinu, a uh, Smithsonian, they actually wrote like the first list of threatened plant species in the 1970s. Up until that, it just wasn't on the radar. It was mostly about uh, birds and, and mammals. And actually this document here, Mosquin, which uh, George Argus wrote that first list of plants, you know, plants didn't even have like their own part in that book. They were sort of lumped in with like mosses and insects. You know, there, there were huge chapters for marine mammals and terrestrial mammals and birds, but, you know, plants were sort of at the end uh, of this, this book. But it, it is sort of the first recognition of, of plants that can be, that they can be endangered. So why, the other reason for this is, um, you know, it's been identified that maybe some of the recovery uh, planning uh, that's been done for plants and other species is not really ambitious enough. You know, we don't talk about transplantations. We don't actively look at things like, you know, Kentucky coffee tree, where can we go plant more of them and increase the, um, the area of occurrence or the extent of occupancy, things that could actually like change the Kasiwik status. And there's always this question with plants, you know, when do we actually count them as part of the wild population and how long do they stay part of what Kasiwik calls a manipulated population where they're not actually part of the, uh, the wild population and they count towards assessing the status of the species. Just gonna wrap it up talking about opportunities. Most people are probably familiar with the new global biodiversity framework. Uh, um, you know, if we actually implement this thing, it'll make a huge difference for uh, biodiversity. And there's many uh, targets in there that really relate directly to conserving trees and forests. Uh, and in our shape of nature, we identified a bunch of different opportunities to, um, to protect these species. I'm not gonna go through them, you can access it, but includes like preventing the spread of invasive species, conservation focused uh, tree planting and reforestation. And we heard about some of the species at risk that are being planted, uh, restoring indigenous land use practices, things like, uh, like managed fires are really important for some species of trees. Um, seed banks to find those trees that are resistant. When I go back into our woods here, you know, most white ash have been affected by emerald ash borer, but there's a few ash and elm that seem to hang on. You know, those are maybe going to be our forests of the future. Uh, and then conserved and restored areas for those species with small ranges, small populations are, that is critical. 
one of the initiatives we're working on at Wildlife Conservation Society is around key biodiversity areas. Hopefully most people have heard of it. It's another way to kind of zero in on like where these trees with small ranges and small populations are and try to protect them. Uh, key biodiversity areas are a global initiative to identify the most important places for nature, um, include criteria um, and for many of these trees, things related to like threatened or restricted biodiversity would trigger uh, key biodiversity areas. Uh, I encourage you to check out the map of all the um, identified key biodiversity areas and one that are in progress. One that was just um, put into the database is Bickford Oak Woods, which was largely, which is near Sarnia, Ontario. Uh, and it was designated because it's the only stand of, of swamp cottonwood in Canada. Um, so key biodiversity areas are a great way to, to highlight the importance of a place. And for many of these trees that are small range or small population, a great way to, um, uh, to sort of put them on the, the map for conservation. Key biodiversity areas are not prescriptive, but they're a, a, a way for local groups to get involved and try to protect um, some of these areas, be it through private land stewardship um, or other, other means. And I just want to conclude by saying, you know, like there are trees are sort of like one of these, these things that many people can be involved in. Like as an individual, there's not a lot I can do to help recover whooping cranes or, um, or grizzly bears out west, but you know, there are trees around me that are at, at risk and there's things that I can do. So locally growing trees at risk, um, helping to identify and spot invasive species, having um, community science to help uh, map out new occurrences, and you know, volunteering, for example, as a KBA care, care, caretaker or some other civil society group to help these, these trees. And you know, I, I just kind of in conclusion, I mean, here's an example of a species that was once at risk, the Eastern bluebird, and it was civic action. It was sort of these like thousands of small acts of conservation that, that helped to take the, uh, the Eastern bluebird off of things like the blue list, or it was actually uh, assessed by Kasiwik as rare uh, and help it be, be common today and hopefully when we sort of talk about trees in 10 years from now, we'll have more stories of recovery to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a very good overview and a great start to our topic today. Um, I will uh, maybe ask Natalie to uh, get ready for her, uh, her presentation next. So while she's doing that, a uh, quick reminder, if you do have questions, please post them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We will... Uh, answer your questions later where will we bring the panelists back um, to do the Q&A period. All right, Natalie, you take it away when you're ready. Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Stoffel and I'm a vegetation ecologist here at Mount Revelstoke and Glacier National Parks. And I'll be um, speaking, you speaking to you today about five needle pines, so white bark and liver pine, and how we do conservation and restoration efforts, including seed collection for those two species at risk. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories of the Silks, the Shwetmek, um, the Sinaiaks, and the Tanaha, um, and this is their land um, unceded territory. So thank you for having me today. So I'll be talking about white bark pines with the, the photo here. It's a high elevation five needle pine. Um, it's Sarah listed endangered under the Species at Risk Act. And then limber pine, uh, which is listed as endangered under, well, was recommended for listed as endangered under Kosiwik, um, but it's not currently Sarah listed. These two um, tree species play a really important role in the ecology of the ecosystems in which they live. So like I said, white bark lives at high elevation subalpine habitats, and it's a really important um, species for that area because it provides habitat for birds and mammals um, and an important food source. It has really nutrient rich cones. So think about the pine nuts you buy at the grocery store to make pesto. Um, it's rare to find that high protein, high fat resource available in alpine environments. So a lot of species like Clark's nutcrackers and grizzly bears rely on them. Limber pine is similar, has really nice fatty cones. Um, the difference there is that limber pine will release the seeds on its own, whereas white bark pine requires the Clark's nutcracker to open the, the cones by itself to access the seeds. So these are both very important tree species, iconic to the mountain ranges in BC and Alberta. Uh, limber pines at slightly lower elevations, and then white bark occupies that subalpine um, habitat niche. The primary threats to these two species are very similar. Uh, climate change and changing um, fire regimes are one of them. So historical fire suppression, and then climate changing the frequency and severity of fires is impacting ecosystems across their range, including white bark and limber. 
Mountain pine beetle is a native forest insect, but it's recently due to warming temperatures expanded in elevation and been able to attack more and more white bark pine, whereas usually it used to be in the past, it used to be a little bit too cold in those environments. But the biggest threat to both of these species is non-native uh, white pine blister rust. So this is the photo that you can see uh, the blisters of that on that tree that are quite orange. Um, and it comes out as this, if you were to press any of those blisters, it's kind of like this craft mac and cheese pattern. Um, and it relies on a complex um, series of dispersal. So it requires an alternate host, which is usually a rivies plant, so like a black currant. And so it'll transmit from a five needle pine, so western white pine, limber pine, white bark pine, sugar pine, any of those five needle pines are susceptible. And then the spores will release um, and then take, um, use the alternate host, which is ribes or um, even castalasia. So some of our paintbrush species can access as alternate host. They develop there and then go back to the pine trees. So if I was to touch this tree and then touch another tree, it doesn't transmit that way. It requires that alternate host. But that, um, this non-native fungus was introduced in the early 1900s um, to, to Vancouver. I think it was like 1910 in Vancouver. It also got introduced on the East Coast and it started affecting our native species. Um, our native tree species or fine needle pines have very limited natural defenses against it. It originated in um, southeastern Europe and Asia. Um, so the trees there kind of have co-evolved with this fungus, but our trees not having ever experienced it until it was introduced um, have a really hard time. So we see high levels of mortality due to this fungus. Um, because we are in a national park, um, we, we reside on federal land and the Species Act Risk Act applies to us. So uh, it applies differently according to different jurisdictions, but it is a federal law and I'll go into that in a little bit. It came fully into force in 2004. Um, and then since then, all the uh, federal governments and jurisdictions on which uh, federal land resides have been kind of looking to this as the guiding document for how we manage species at risk. And so here's a, a slide about how it applies elsewhere in Canada. So obviously as a national park, it applies directly to us. The, um, the intent applies to provincial lands, but it's the, the authorities are delegated to provincial governments. So they're giving the first opportunity to protect within their own legislation, provincial or territorial, how they see fit. So they can come up with their own um, species at risk laws and acts, um, which are kind of the first step. But if that was to fail, so if, if the federal government decides that for some reason the province is doing not enough or an insufficient job at protecting these species at risk, they can apply a section 80, which is an emergency protection order. It's been done only very, very rarely. Uh, the first one was a greater sage grouse around 2013, and then only a handful of species since. So it's very, very rare to see that section 80 applied. So for most of the time, the Species at Risk Act um, applies on federal lands. Um, so here we are, just to situate you in terms of where I'm speaking uh, to you from today. So I'm here in Revelstoke in that kind of lower left corner. And my, uh, the two parks that I look after, Mount Revelstoke and Glacier National Park. Um, I work in close collaboration with colleagues of Jasper, Lake Louise, Banff, Golden, and Radium. So on all those mountain national parks there. And all of these mountain national parks have white bark pine. Um, only a few have limber pine. So those in the Rockies, Southern Rockies have limber pine. Uh, but we don't actually have limber pine here in Revelstoke. Um, I'll speak a little bit about our Parks Canada approach. So we, we really look at restoring um, ecological integrity of our native ecosystems. And we've been fortunate to get funding from a conservation and restoration um, pool of money and also a nature legacy that the federal government announced a few years ago. So a lot of our restoration work kind of comes from that and we work collaborative, collaboratively with a lot of different partners. So we do like to rely on science and evidence-based approaches. So we do long-term health tran transect monitoring. So we revisit the same sites um, once every five years to see how blister rust and mortality rates are changing. Um, and then, so this was a paper that we produced from a previous round of sampling. Since then, we've done a, a range of sampling in 2019 and our next scheduled sample is 2024. So every five years we go and revisit these transects to see how um, particularly blister rust is changing over time. Kind of gives us a bit of a sense of where the hotspots are um, on the landscape. Once we do identify those hotspots in areas where there's a large amount of blister rust and high pressure of disease, uh, we go and we do some um, 
cone collection. So we look for healthy trees and heavily infected stands. And those are ones that have a higher likelihood of having a natural resistance, a genetic resistance to blister rust. So we seek those out. We usually look for stands that have over 70% infection rates. And if we find some healthy trees in there, those are, become the target for our cone collection. Because so what we're trying to do is naturally recreate um, and help the trees uh, kind of speed up their evolution a little bit. So we're not doing any genetic modification, but we are doing genetic selection. So if there's trees that are performing well um, naturally and have native defensives against these blister rest um, agents, then we go and we collect seed um, from those cones. It's a bit of an involved process. We climb them in this early summer, so usually June or July. We put cages on um, and then the birds come. They try and get through the cages when they can't, which is why we have them on there. And then we come back in September um, when the cones are ripe and then we, we harvest them. Uh, some of those seeds turn into seedlings, so we send them off to nursery and we grow them out and then do restoration. So we find some old burns or disturbed areas and we plant those seedlings there. And then a handful of them actually go into some research plots as well, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, these really high value trees that we do collect cones from, we don't want them to succumb to mountain pine beetles. So we put these pheromones on them. We put out GLV, green leaf volatile and verbenone. And that kind of just signals um, mountain pine beetles that those trees are full and that they shouldn't attack them. So it protects individual trees. It's hard to protect a full stand that way, but it's quite effective for single trees. So we target our really high value plus trees, the ones that we're collecting cones from. Um, and as I said, a subset of seedlings go to blister rust resistance trials. So we work with our partners um, in BC for this. This is at the Kalamaka Research Station in Vernon. And all these little um, white bark pine seedlings have been subjected to a very normalized load, but more than you'd see kind of naturally of uh, blister rust. So they go into a growth chamber um, and they get inoculated. So we artificially put spores of ribes onto them so that they all get infected at the same level. And then we plant them out in um, kind of these field boxes and then we monitor them over time to see which parent trees are doing better. So they're all labeled based on the parent tree that they came from. In certain families, you can kind of see here, there's some brown trees that are dying in the middle. Certain families are less resistant to blister rust and certain families are more resistant. So a bunch of different partners contribute uh, tree seeds that turn into seedlings that go into these trials and it really helps us kind of determine which um, parent trees are in fact good winners and have high natural levels of resistance. Parks Canada, we also do habitat restoration. So we do use prescribed fire to kind of help restore fire on the landscape. So in areas where there's been historical fire suppression, we target those for ecosystem restoration. So in certain areas we'll do prescribed fires and then we'll, we'll go in and plant some white bark pine trees if it's appropriate habitat to do so. We also do habitat restoration, so thinning around our plus trees. So again, this tree here is a really high value mother tree, you could call it. We collected cones from and we know it has high resistance values. So to protect it from future wildfires, we actually go in and clear it uh, a little bit of an opening around it. So all the competing species of subwalk playing fir, um, Engelmann spruce, um, so it's just white bark there. It gives it more of a chance to regenerate. So Clark's nutcrackers will come and actually cache seeds so this tree can actually have some more seedlings around. It also gives it a bit of a competitive advantage, but the major um, reason we do this is for wildfire protection. Um, as Parks Canada, we do a lot of education and outreach. So we go into classrooms and we've developed some fun interactive games, um, even some metal pine cones to try and teach people about these habitats. Because unless you care about something, um, there's less um, kind of means to support that. So we're really trying to um, get more stewardship uh, and awareness of these two really important species. We do a lot of collaboration with other agencies as well. So we work with BC, Alberta, the nonprofit White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation. We work with the BC Tree Seed Center, the National Tree Seed Center, and a bunch of other organizations as well. And we, all, we all have the same goal of trying to restore the functionality of these white bark pine and five needle pine ecosystems. So we get together on a regular basis, sometimes once or twice a year. Um, now it's a little bit more virtual, but we try and do a one in-person meeting. And we have a, a pretty broad vision to establish self-sustaining and rust resistant metapopulations of white bark and liver pine throughout the Canadian range. So obviously we can't do this alone. As, federal, as a federal agency, we only have small footprints of land that are protected areas, but obviously 
point bark and limber pine occur outside of those areas. So we really count on our collaboration with partners so that we can scale up beyond our boundaries and really try and put a dent to this vision here. So within the mountain national parks, these are just a few stats that we've achieved in about 10 years of doing work. So we planted more than 80,000 white bark and 17,000 limber pine. We found more than 500 plus trees for white bark pine. Those are those parents and infected stands that we think might have a high probability of being resistant to blister rust. Um, almost 100 limber pine trees as well. We've submitted 279 trees for screening. Those are those garden beds that I showed you earlier. And then we've restored a bunch of different hectares of habitat um, through fire and mechanical thinning. So with that, um, I will leave it for questions. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much to the National Tree Seed Centre for the invitation to speak today. Um, my name is Claire Wilson, and I'm here with Pam Mills, and we are both with the Nova Scotia Department of Natural uh, Resources and Renewables. Um, we would like to acknowledge that we're speaking to you today from Mi'kmaq, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And we were invited here today to speak about uh, black ash or wisco as it's known in Mi'kmaq, um, which is a species at risk in Nova Scotia. So going from a federal species at risk uh, presentation to a provincial species at risk. Um, so I'm gonna start out by giving just a really quick introduction to black ash as a species um, and an overview of its uh, status as a species at risk. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Pam, and she's going to talk a little bit more about some of the legal protections and permitting requirements for working with black ash in Nova Scotia, and also give a quick update on some ongoing work that we've been involved in to identify and map core habitat, um, and some monitoring and research initiatives that involve um, seed collection. So first, a couple of words of introduction about our department for those who aren't from Nova Scotia. Our, our Provincial Department of Natural Resources and Renewables is responsible for managing our forests and wildlife in the province, as well as our mineral and energy resources. And our biodiversity program within that department, which is where Pam and I work, um, is responsible for working with partners um, towards the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, including species at risk. Um, and we currently have 63 provincially listed uh, species at risk in Nova Scotia, some of which are also federally listed under the Species at Risk Act that um, Natalie was talking about. So today we're gonna to be talking about one of those um, and that's black ash. Mary talked a little bit about this species in her introduction. Um, so just a few uh, words about black ash as a species. It's a broadleafed hardwood tree. Um, it's a member of the olive family, one of just a couple of native ash species that we have uh, here in Nova Scotia. Um, it's provincially widespread, uh, but rare. So it, uh, it occurs across the province um, in Nova Scotia, but tends to be found in very low numbers at any one site. Um, it's typically found in poorly drained wetland habitats with seasonal flooding, as, especially in wooded swamps and floodplains. Um, its wood has many uses. It's, it's been harvested um, for uh, making barrels and baskets and tools, furniture, musical instruments, um, and so on. And, uh, and culturally, as, as Mary mentioned, it's a really important species to the Mi'kmaq um, in the Maritimes, particularly for basket making. So this slide just uh, shows the uh, global range of, of black ash and, uh, and also its provincial distribution. Um, so you can see on the left uh, that it's a, an Eastern North American species with about half of its range in Canada and the other half in the US. Uh, it tends to be much more common towards the middle parts of its range um, and rarer and, and uh, more sparse out, out towards the edges, including in Nova Scotia. Um, so the map on the right uh, shows locations where black ash has been reported in Nova Scotia. So you can see, as I mentioned, that it is distributed pretty much right across the province. Um, but each of those dots could represent perhaps just one tree or a small number of trees 
Um, so it does occur in very low numbers. And there's also a very small number of known mature individuals that produce seed. So a few of the uh, biological factors that are limiting or challenging for black ash in Nova Scotia include um, that it's, it's a slow growing and, uh, and moderately long lived tree, um, typically living to about 130 uh, to 150 years. It has very low rates of seed reproduction um, and low rates of dispersal in Nova Scotia. And most of the regeneration that we see is from stump sprouting or suckering. And we have a very small number of mature seed bearing trees in the province. Um, it's thought to have low rates of genetic exchange with the rest of the global population, um, perhaps because of its sort of relative geographic isolation. Uh, it seems to be susceptible to a number of fungal diseases, um, poor growth and stunting. Um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of our trees show dieback at the top, um, although the mechanisms for that are, are poorly understood. Um, and it's near the northern extent of its range in Nova Scotia, which may be a, a contributing factor um, to a lot of these other things as well. Some of the key threats that it faces, um, the big one uh, would be habitat loss and alteration, one of the big ones, I guess, um, especially wetland infilling, um, uh, anything that changes hydrology of a site, uh, things like road construction or clearing for agriculture. Um, it can be threatened by forestry practices, even though it is protected currently in Nova Scotia, it's quite a difficult uh, tree to, it can be quite difficult to identify. Um, accident, accidental harvesting um, can be a threat. Uh, dieback and disease, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and then I guess the really big one after habitat loss would be invasive species in the form of um, the emerald ash borer, uh, which Mary mentioned. Um, that was first recorded in Nova Scotia in 2018. Um, it's currently limited to a small area in the Halifax Regional Municipality um, in, in the Bedford area, uh, but it is sort of slowly spreading outwards from there. Um, and, and based on its impacts elsewhere, it poses a, a hugely significant threat um, to our black ash in Nova Scotia. So based on those limiting factors and threats and its rarity in Nova Scotia, uh, black ash was listed as threatened under our Provincial Endangered Species Act in 2013. Um, so threatened is the second most serious uh, listing um, after endangered. And that um, sort of set us on a course as a province of, of um, conservation planning or recovery planning for, for black ash. Um, a couple of the steps that sort of flow from that provincial listing are uh, under our act um, are that we're required to develop a, a recovery plan for the species um, and also to establish a recovery team. So there was a recovery plan for black ash um, uh, put out in 2015 in Nova Scotia and that plan is currently under review. Um, that's the sort of big picture blueprint for how we're proposing to recover the species um, in Nova Scotia. And we have a recovery team. Um, the current membership has been active since about uh, 2019. And that is a small group of um, species experts and key knowledge holders appointed by our minister to provide advice to us, the department in the development of the recovery plan. So that team is, is currently in the process of reviewing and updating that, um, uh, that 2015 plan. And I should mention also that the, the recovery plan, um, the existing recovery plan was developed in a, a very um, collaborative uh, process with uh, the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia. And um, we have Mi'kmaq participation on our recovery team as well um, to uh, make sure that we're, uh, working in partnership and incorporating those perspectives into recovery planning. Um, at the federal level, black ash has been assessed uh, nationally as threatened by Kosiwik in 2018. Um, and it's not yet listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act, but it is under consideration for listing in the future. So it may become a federal uh, national species at risk as well. And the link at the bottom uh, here is just our um, Endangered Species Act, if anybody's interested in more information on that. Uh, so I thought I'd give you just like a really quick um, sort of high level snapshot of some of the goals and objectives that are in our provincial recovery plan. Um, our long term recovery goal for black ash um, over greater than 20 year period is to ensure that conditions allow for the restoration 
of self-sustaining and ecologically functioning populations in the province. Um, and then the sort of sub objectives under that um, speak to sort of themes around uh, raising awareness of, of black ash ecology and identification, mitigating threats where possible, initiating research to address uh, priority knowledge gaps, uh, maintaining, protecting and enhancing the current population and distribution and protecting core habitat and seed producing trees. So there's a number of actions identified and prioritized in the recovery plan. Um, uh, uh, sort of under each of these headings, and you can find more detail if anyone's interested at the link um, provided at the bottom. Um, but just to mention that that recovery plan, like I said, is under review. Um, and with the arrival of emerald ash borer in the province, I expect that the actions and priorities um, in the updated uh, plan will be um, sort of significantly shifted towards emerald, you know, response to emerald ash borer. Um, and perhaps with more of an emphasis on things like seed collection and seed banking um, in response to that threat. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Pam. Thank you, Claire. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about uh, kind of the legislative uh, things and um, what we've been working on. So under the Nova Scotia Endangered Species Act, it is prohibited to possess harm, disturb, uh, endangered or threatened species or their habitat. And, but we may issue permits under the act to possess or for activities that cause harm or disturbance. And they can be only uh, issued under very specific circumstances. First, uh, scientific purposes related to the conservation of the species. This has to be in line with the recovery plan, these activities and also for the protection of human health and safety. This helps us to uphold the legal protection of species at risk, but also ensure that scientific or, in, or research activity is coordinated and aligned with the overarching Conservation Act priorities outlined in our recovery plan. Questions about permits or the permit application process can be submitted to our biodiversity at novascotia.ca email. Next slide, please. A component of our recovery plans involves identifying core habitat. This was done for black ash in 2021 in collaboration with the recovery team. Core habitat is defined as specific areas of habitat essential for the long-term survival of rec and recovery of species. In the case of black ash in Nova Scotia, it was described to include all of the known occurrences and associated habitat, things like the surrounding wetlands and river floodplains. This was a precautionary approach we took to account for uncertainty in the population health, the seed production and genetics and the specific and significance of threats like emerald ash borer. Once identified, Core habitat, core habitat can be legally protected or designated through regulation by our minister. At this stage, black ash is defined, the core habitat for black ash is defined, but not designated, but this could provide additional protection in the future. Next slide, please. In addition to core habitat, we've been developing a monitoring plan for black ash to track the population's distribution and health over time. Also identifying and prioritizing mature seed bearing stands. We've also been working with the National Tree Seed Center and other partners such as the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, the Uni Unimaki Institute of Natural Resources, Parks Canada, Acadia University and others to increase the seed collections for black ash for genetic preservation and research. In 2001, we collected seeds and leaves with Donnie McPhee from the National Tree Seed Center for a genetic uh, study uh, on North American ash. In 2022, we initiated a seed collection network to monitor stands in different regions or eco districts across the province and we prepared for collection in case we had a big seed year, but that hasn't happened yet. So we're continuing to monitor for hopefully when that'll happen. 
So other uh, current and upcoming priorities have been identified by the recovery team that have been identified by the recovery team uh, include developing a response plan for emerald ash borer, including a review of treatment options and discussing and developing guidelines for planting black ash from a conservation perspective. These are topics for discussion that will likely be highlighted or included in a revised recovery plan. Next slide, please. So if you're looking for more information on black ash or our species at risk program in Nova Scotia, you can visit the sites that we have listed here. The Provincial Species at Risk website is where the uh, 2015 recovery plan is also available. And uh, any other inquiries can uh, go to our biodiversity at novascotia.ca email. And you can also report any uh, sightings of species at risk or biodiversity in general to that email. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Claire. Um, I appreciate you coming in like that. Um, it looks like um, Okay, that looks like mine, Matt. Sure does. Let me just skip ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not just mine. Okay, yeah, good. There we go. <laughs> All right. Everybody can see that now. It's good to know that they kept running without us. Um, all right. So I am Matt Brophy. Uh, I'm a technician at uh, NTSC. I've been here for three years. And uh, basically, I help with all operational activities from collecting, storing, testing, everything. And I'm also running our cryo banking program. Uh, and so I will be presenting the National Tree Seed Center's role in species at risk conservation and research. So uh, the National Tree Seed Center is unique in being the only national seed bank for wild tree and shrub seed in Canada. And we have been around since 1967. Uh, there are over 1,700 seed banks in the world, but only a few specialize in wild species. Our facility and programs are truly a, a proven insurance plan for future needs. Uh, we aim to bring people to or bring organizations together uh, and experts to work on species of concern. Um, we're also always trying to be proactive to threats like a lot of people have already mentioned, um, uh, thinking and acting in long term so that we have viable germplasm available into the future. Uh, the ultimate goal is that we can successfully grow out plants in places that will, they will thrive. Um, so what is ex situ conservation? Uh, basically, it means any way to remove move a plant off site and away from a threat um, which is the opposite of protecting or managing an ecosystem in place. Uh, both have benefits and are meant uh, to be complementary tools. Uh, so uh, while it may seem like a new idea, seed collection for future needs has been around for a long time. Uh, indigenous people have been storing seed for millennia and moving edible species into uh, to forest gardens. Uh, Ag Canada had tree breeding programs on the prairie starting in the 1800s. Uh, tree improvement uh, and developing seed orchards supply has taken place in Canada since the 1950s. Um, and this helps counter climate change, uh, pest and economic pressures with higher quality timber. All of these early strategies help plant over 600 million trees a year in Canada, but they all began with strategic wild seed collections. Um, so, um, However, we can't be everywhere at once, so we need two systems to prioritize our conservation needs. Um, so what do we do to prioritize our efforts? As said, the best strategy for NTSC is to be proactive. So proactive seed banking before threats impact genetic diversity across the landscape. If we have no other ex situ conservation programs and know little about the adaptive capacity of a species, it's best to collect as many seed lots over their range. Um, so NTSC's goal is to have seed from every woody plant species from across their natural range. Um, then we'll often look to national conservation assessments to gauge where to put our efforts. This includes uh, Confergen and uh, Carf, 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 
initiatives focused on trees. Um, basically, if we have a rating of three in our database by a province or a national uh, first nation, we would be uh, uh, focusing on those areas a lot more. Uh, then after that, we will look at rankings from conservation data centers like Kasiwik and local experts working in very specialized ecosystems and restoration. Um, but then, of course, like the most reactive strategies are going to be following uh, Species at Risk Act recoveries and Canadian Food Inspection C uh, like quarantine zones. And by the time we're doing that, it's very difficult to improve population viability um, and get good seed collections without needing to move in populations to breed with those lonely uh, uh, parents that are left. At this point, we've lost a lot of the genetics in that area. So it's always good to be proactive before we get into that point. So this is a graph of sh showing species in the NTSC gene bank currently that are assessed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. Um, this timeline shows our rising number of collections um, as we react to uh, threats and also as a result of collaboration and funding to support us. Um, so the majority of these collections are stored in minus 20 in a separate freezer with the idea that collections will not be opened again until they're required for uh, restoration. And early collections really just focused on, they were just opportunistic. Um, they were curious. They were looking at exploring dormancy, breaking treatments, or testing the, you know, the life inside storage. Um, but our role after... The Convention on Biological Diversity was ratified in 96, began shifting towards long-term uh, storage of our collections. And so in 1998, we started identifying important uh, seed lots, and there's now over 6,000 of them in storage um, to be put away in case of emergency. And uh, quite quickly after that uh, was the emergence of emerald ash borer. Uh, that was detected in Detroit and Windsor, and Ash was such an important a city and e ecological genus, so we had to prioritize those species. And so you, you'll see a lot more ash collections coming up. And then around the same time, uh, the the effects of blister white pine blister rust was being felt in by Parks Canada and their uh, white bark pine and limber pine, so we were receiving some collections from them. Uh, so black ash kind of dominates this graph, but you can see some of the bumper crop years in 2009, 2013. And then in 2019, we had a huge bumper crop year and made hundreds of collections of ash in, along its range. And that's really what brought me to the NTC because they needed extra hands to process all those collections. Um, then in 2021, uh, where we lacked seed, but stands were in, at imminent risk, um, we were collecting leaf samples of the larger trees for genomic studies. So natural ash populations have adapted to their environments like many species and preserving that germplasm from a significant number of those populations will help to facilitate reintroduction of ash species once the threat of EAB is kind of dissipated or trees resistant to the insect uh, are bred and introduced like we using the, the seed that we have. So the easiest way to assemble a breeding material is to collect seed from native stands. Uh, so when properly handled and stored, ash seed will remain alive for many decades. Uh, seed can be easily distributed to scientists, growers to produce seedlings for EAB research, breeding, uh, genetics projects, other scientific study and future reintroduction efforts. And just recently, we sent 600 uh, uh, samples from 600 of our seed lots uh, to Penn State University for some genomics work. Uh, so Eastern Hemlock, I have recently, before coming to the Seed Center, was working on HWA. Um, and so I've witnessed hemlock stands in Nova Scotia go from green one year to brown the next year, and it is quite alarming. Uh, so the national management plan calls for seed due to uh, imminent risk, especially to eastern hemlock. Uh, western hemlock is not as affected, but the CFIA still regulates the entire province to prevent movement of their, that timber. Uh, the hemlock cones are actually quite difficult to collect. Uh, the better, better quality cones are at the top of the canopy. And so using an arborist or uh, you know, anyone climbing trees 
that's what you need to get to the top and cut those branches. Um, but even a few liters of cones can result in thousands of viable seeds if they're cleaned and handled properly. Um, so this map uh, and the collection dates at the bottom show our efforts to uh, conserve hemlock. Uh, collaborations with Nova Scotia have helped a lot. In uh, recent years, we just in 2021, we had 43 collections from some of the, the worst hit locations in Nova Scotia by HWA. Uh, so, of course, collaboration is always extremely valuable to us. If you have questions or are willing to help us, always contact us or Provincial Seed Banks to, for more information on where collections are needed. So now I'm going to talk about some of the factors that undermine routine long-term storage and like conventional bank seed banking conditions. Uh, they were kind of recently de defined by Valerie Pence in this paper. Uh, and so there's all these exceptionality factors that I'm going to go through. So EF1, the seeds are not available or accessible. So some seeds do not produce, uh, or so some species do not produce seeds due to a lack of pollinators or just they're very rare species and they don't have enough population to, to create seed. Um, and there's also some that are just really hard to access, like white bark pine that uh, was mentioned by Natalie. Uh, they have to go up there, they have to cage the cones in advance and then come back when they're ripe because they're in competition with the Clark's, nice, uh, Clark's Nutcracker. Um, so when there's no seed available, we can still play a role in conserving plants without seed by storing germplasm in the form of shoot tips, uh, dormant buds, and clonal tissues like somatic embryos. Um, EF2 is recalcitrant seed. So these are species that do not tolerate desiccation to moisture contents that are required for freezing at minus 20. So there's ice formation when they're frozen, and then that leads to lethal, uh, it's lethal for the tissues. Um, so this is where cryogenic storage and liquid nitrogen is often the only option for long-term storage. Uh, oaks are an example of a recalcitrant seed in Canada. They cannot be dried down without losing viability. Uh, EF3 short lived seeds in storage. So, seeds, some species have seeds that can tolerate desiccation, but they do not survive freezing or just do not maintain viability at minus 20. So, many of these species can also be cryo preserved to prolong their, their seed banking life. Uh, butternut is a species that can be desiccated but does not survive long periods. And so, I'm going to get into the, how we work with butternut. Uh, EF4 are seeds that are deeply dormant. And so these seeds will survive storage, but it is very difficult to, to germinate them once they come out. So basswood is an example of this. It's a species that we know survives, but we have a really hard time germinating it. And that's probably due to a physiological dormancy. So it may require extended uh, stratification periods between you know, alternating between moist, warm, and cold conditions. Uh, you can also stimulate germination with hormones and growth regulators like gibberellic acid. Uh, and dormancy has actually also been avoided by isolating embryos from seed and culturing in vitro. So as mentioned, I am currently assigned to working on our cryopreservation program. I have recently had the opportunity to travel to two of the top uh, plant cryopreservation labs in the U.S., um, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, as well as the USDA Center for Agricultural Resources in Fort Collins, Colorado. So I'm quickly trying to get up to speed on techniques that are used around the world to preserve endangered species and liquid nitrogen. Uh, we currently have 31 species stored in liquid nitrogen at AFC, which is a, a tool that not many people have. Okay, this is a, a phase diagram showing the safe or or like the orange section at the bottom as being a safe zone and the yellow conditions being lethal ice formation based off of the interaction between moisture content and temperature. So you have temperature on the left side and moisture content along the top. And if you look at the bean icon on the left, top left, you can see that that's been dried to a safe moisture content. And as it's being cooled down, it stays in that safe zone. Then if you look at the, the acorn, which represents a recalcitrant seed, 
where that's got a higher moisture content, it has to get through that lethal ice formation zone, the yellow zone, in less than half a second uh, so that it won't form ice formation. And one of the ways you can help that is by removing the uh, embryonic axes so it can be cooled at a much faster rate. So one of the things you're looking for when you're storing in liquid nitrogen is, is to achieve the vitrification, which is called the, a glassy state. Um, if you look at that picture on the right side, you see two droplets. One is a vitrified droplet and one is a frozen droplet. So that has ice formation that kills cells. Um, there's certain cryoprotectants that you can use to aid in getting this vitrification. Uh, what it does is replaces the water with more viscous solution to, so you can get that, that, that glassy state. And one way to think about it, if you look at a bowl of jello with fruit in it, <clears throat> You can look at those the fruit as as cells inside of that tissue, and that glassy state is forming almost like it's a solid state, but it has some flexibility to it. It has some movement, and so it doesn't cause any harm to the tissues. And there are several techniques that I've learned to use um, to introduce uh, these vitrification solutions. Um, one is droplet vitrification, and there's also these encapsulation uh, procedures that are you make a synthetic seed out of an alginate, alginic acid bead. I won't go too deep into that. So this is some of the work that we've done with cryo recently. So on the left, you have some species that re required some protocol development. And then on the right, there, these are species that are, are a little bit easier to store there. They can dry down and they just, we just want to like prolong their life in storage. So we are putting them in cryo. So for butternut, research has been underway since 98, when the butternut canker risk began rising. And Tannis Beardmore was leading, was a leading researcher <clears throat> experimenting with what was assumed to be recalcitrant species. But as it turns out, if that removing the embryonic axes from the seed, they were able to dry the embryo and freeze in liquid nitrogen. Um, so we currently have 326 accessions and with over 36,000 embryonic axes have been stored. Uh, and we recently had 60 to 100% recovery of seed lots after seven years of storage. So that's a great success story. Um, due to uh, the removal of most of the cotyledon material, they actually have to be uh, germinated in vitro. So they, they don't have any of that the food that they would normally have in the seed. So we have to supplement that. Um, magnolia, uh, Melissa Spearing has done some work with magnolia here, magnolia cuminata and uh, tripatella. And they are, list, are listed as endangered by the species at risk in Ontario, as there are only about 282 trees left in Southern Ontario. Uh, growers have had a hard time germinating this species. NTSC has only had, um, has never had a germinant with the four collections they had in the past. Uh, work by Melissa has has kind of given us a clue as to why she did some tetrazoleum staining, which is a stain that stains that will dye living tissue and will leave dead tissue unstained. And by doing that, she saw that the embryo, a lot of the embryos were still alive, but all of the endosperm and food stores were gone. So they those food stores were just spoiled and causing mold during growth. <laughs> and so by using some of the protocols adapted from the butternut work, we were able to rescue embryos using in vitro germination. And also that a modified approach for assessing magnolia species is currently in development by Melissa based off of that work. Uh, also, Gary Oak and Burr Oak, we are currently in the early, early stages of trying to work with those species. Yeah, recovery program success. Uh, here's just a few photos of um, the successful butternut recovery using in vitro germination, as well as a photo of Melissa saying goodbye to some of her magnolia from her trials that will be put back in the landscape. And that's it for me. Thank you, Matt. Yep. That was beautiful. Um, so next up um, is Nina and Jenny. 
Is Natalie back? Did she want a chance to finish up her? Um, Natalie, can you, are you, are you um, able to speak? Because the last time you, your voice wasn't coming through, you want to see if you can? Oh, still not there. No. Mm. <laughs> okay, so Jenny, sorry. we'll let you go and, and maybe she can get herself up and running by the end of yours. Um, so you okay. and Nina can, yeah. Sounds good. There we go. Um, let's see here. So if you go at the top there, you'll see four over. It's a slideshow. There you go. Oh, that works too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm done from beginning. There you go. So thanks very much, everyone. And um, thanks to Melissa and the team at the NTSC for inviting me. My name is Jenny McCune, and I'd like to say hello from Southern Alberta. Um, so I'm speaking to you from the University of Lethbridge, which is on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, so today I want to talk to you about some of the research that my students and I have been doing actually in Southern Ontario. And I've titled this talk according to um, basically my, my main message I want to get across, which is that true recovery means having more viable populations of a plant species at risk than we have right now. And so what we're trying to do is to test uh, translocation as a recovery tool for plant species at risk. So here's a map of, of Canada with uh, kind of the, the concentration of species at risk. This is for all species at risk, but if you looked at the one for plants, it would look pretty much the same. Um, and we are working in Southern Ontario here, which is a landscape like we saw with, with Dan's talk that looks a lot like this. We have this super highly fragmented forest um, and we have these little remnant populations of some of these plant species left. And so you would think that perhaps these little fragments are quite well surveyed and that we know where all our plant species at risk remaining populations are, but we actually don't. Um, so here's an example of the, the wood poppy, which is endangered in Canada. Um, we know it was collected way back in 1887 near the city of London, but then nobody sort of registered it again until the 1970s when there were a few potential sightings. Uh, then a population was discovered in 1987. As of 2007, the COSIWIC status report knew about three populations and they said, because we have this big spectacular yellow flower, it's unlikely that we've seriously uh, overlooked the species. I beg to differ. Uh, here is a population of wood poppy in mid-June when the wood poppy is in full bloom. And I think if you didn't have the right person that knew about this plant, or if you weren't looking at it super close up, <laughs> you might not notice it. So I thought that there's probably a lot of populations of plant species, rare plant species or species at risk that we don't know about. So how, how can we make surveys for these species more efficient? So one way to do that is to use something called a species distribution model. And that is basically a way to kind of estimate across a landscape where might be the most, uh, most suitable habitat, the most likely places to find these species. So this is just an example of the, the green dragon, um, which is a special concern species in Ontario. And here you can see these um, green stars are known locations of green dragon in just one portion of its range. So what we can do is input these and input data on climate, soils, topography, things like that. And we can get an output kind of like this. So each of these tiny little squares is a one hectare cell. And I've blanked out all the ones except for the orange and red ones, which are areas of high suitability, high predicted suitability for this species. So as you can see, if you are looking for new or previously unknown populations of green dragon, you should look along these river valleys uh, flowing into Lake Huron. And so that's what we did with a, I had a huge team of graduate students and undergraduates that I worked with as part of my uh, postdoc work. And so we went around over four field seasons to 282 one hectare forest sites across Southern Ontario 
based on species distribution models for about 40 uh, woodland plant species at risk, mostly perennial herbs, but including a few trees and shrubs. And we found about over 100 previously unknown in the sense of not, not in the provincial database uh, tracked species. So nature serve ranked S1, S2, or S3. Uh, and we found that for most species, these models do a good job. In other words, if you are in a place that has predicted high suitability, you have a higher probability of finding the species. That wasn't true for all species. So for example, we did try modeling butternut and for whatever reason, our butternut model was very bad. But for most species, um, getting into the right habitat, according to these models, increases your chance of finding a population. However, we went to many, many places that were suitable for one or more of these species that didn't have them. Oh, and by the way, we found a new population of wood poppy. Um, it was actually in a spot that was not uh, thought by our models to be suitable, but that's kind of, that's a story for another day. So the question then is what limits these species? So if we imagine we have a population of wood poppy in this patch on the top right here that's suitable according to our models, but then we have a lot of other, you know, supposedly suitable patches where the wood poppy does not exist. And so a way to test whether they actually are suitable is actually to bring wood poppy to those sites. Could it be that the wood poppy, which is dispersed by ants, simply can't get across this landscape to access these sites that have suitable habitat? And that relates directly to the conservation question of can we use these species distribution models um, to improve translocation as a recovery tool? And I want to estimate, I want to uh, emphasize here that I'm talking about using this as a recovery tool, not as mitigation. So in other words, not as we are going to destroy these known populations so that we can have a Walmart or a factory and we're gonna move, translocate them somewhere else. No, we need definitely to keep the five populations that we already have. However, four of those five are on private land. We don't know what's gonna happen there. Wouldn't it be nice to have, oh, I don't know, 10, 11, maybe 20 populations safeguarded somewhere on protected land where we can, you know, actually work towards um, recovering the species. And so this led to this big project. It's a, a collaborative project funded by an NSERC Alliance grant in partnership with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, Guyana Say, which is a First Nations run uh, native plant nursery uh, on the Six Nations, um, just south of Brantford, the Wilder Institute, which is the conservation arm of the Calgary Zoo, uh, and myself now based at the University of Lethbridge. So this translocation work has really been led by my PhD student, Emma Nigel in the middle here, along with Nina Hunt, who was our horticultural research technician who is here on the call too, so she can answer any questions about propagating some of these species and many helpers um, like Kirsty here, who's uh, one of our undergraduate field assistants. Now, before we could start on trying to test these things, some of the species we're interested in working with, including the wood poppy, are listed as endangered on the Ontario Endangered Species Act. That means to collect seed, to grow them, and to plant them in different places, we needed a permit under this clause. Um, so this is called a B permit under the ESA because it's for the purpose of research and recovery. Uh, so we submitted a very carefully written uh, permit request on May 5th in 2021. I was completely naive having not applied for one of these before. Thought it would take a couple months. Turned out the permit was not approved until nearly one year later. Um, and there was, you know, Partly that's because in 2019, it, they changed it that the, the environment minister themselves have to sign all of these. Um, but just a kind of a lesson to anyone working in Ontario, you need to put these requests in, these permit requests in um, very early. After this happened to us and, you know, was in danger of kind of, you know, really sending back a lot of our research because of not being able to collect seeds, I learned that our project was definitely not 
the only one. Um, so back in 2021, actually, the, the Office of the Aud Auditor General of Ontario did an audit of the, the, the processes the, the province has for protecting species at risk. And they note several kind of damning things in here, including that no application to harm species or their habitat has ever been denied. And in fact, a lot of approval, approvals have just been granted automatically, um, whereas they've delayed issuing some permits for conservation work while they fast track the other type of permits, where they, which are the permits of development for development. So you can imagine my emails back and forth saying, I'm not harming any population. I'm in fact, not even killing one individual of these plant species. Why is it taking so long to get this permit? In any case, we were very grateful to get the permit because the first step in doing our work is to learn how to propagate some of these species. So the ones listed in red here uh, are ones that are listed under the Ontario Endangered Species Act. So we needed that permit in place before we could collect seeds from them. The other ones are rare, either according to NatureServe or COSIWIC, but um, not endangered or threatened under the, the uh, Endangered Species Act. Here in the photo, we have some seeds of green violet, which Nina was able to germinate. Um, Many of these species, some of them have propagation protocols that you can find, but a lot of them, there isn't necessarily that much information on how to grow them. And so that was one thing that we were interested in doing. Um, and these out of, you know, we've had sort of a list of, of many different rare woodland plants. These are the ones that um, we were able to test and mostly grow. Uh, we chose the top two to work with our translocations because a, they produce tons of seeds, so we don't have worry about getting enough seeds, and we knew that we could grow them and germinate them successfully. So this is the step that you need to do, that we needed to do. So right from collecting, uh, this is the crooked stem master seeds in the field, drying the seeds. Um, they were stratified, uh, just cold stratified for a couple months, I think, and then planted in these germination trays into these plugs that we could then use for our translocation uh, experiments. And these, these adults, well, these, these mature plants here are actually much larger than perhaps what we needed, um, but very healthy. So what we're trying to do here is ask whether we can use these species distribution models to make translocation more successful. The number one reason why translocations often fail is because we don't have a good idea of what the best habitat is. So we might put a species somewhere that isn't actually good. So we thought, could we use these species distribution models um, as a way to target the best places to translocate these species? So again, working with the wood poppy and the crooked stem, working on Nature Conservancy of Canada properties because we know they're protected. Uh, we chose a number of properties and a number of sites that vary in their predicted habitat suitability. And then within those sites, we've planted a number of um, a number of plots with either crocus demaster or the wood poppy. So Emma here and her crew and, and staff with the Nature Conservancy and a number of partners, undergrad students from the University of Guelph. Uh, worked on this last summer and they got about 1,300 wood poppies planted and over 4,000 crooked stem asters. Here's Emma at one of her crooked stem aster plots. And so we will be going back, Emma will be going back with her crew this summer to see what happened, how well did these things survive. We know we had pretty good survival about a month after they were planted. And we're just interested in seeing, um, you know, how do they do and is it at all related to habitat suitability as estimated by our models? So stay tuned. So to end, I, I just like to point out, you know, a lot of other places in the world have been really working on and using plant translocation for recovery way more than Canada has. Uh, this is a book on reintroductions by Joyce Mashinsky and, and Kristen Haskins with the, the U.S. Center for Plant Conservation. In Australia, they've been doing this for so long, they're actually on the third edition on their guidelines for plant translocation. We are doing a little bit here in Canada, but it's a lot less from what I can tell. This is from 10 years ago. 
an article on translocation as a tool to recover plants in the Gary Oak ecosystems. And this author, Clements, notes, you know, we're, we're starting to really think about this more, especially with this, this knowledge that climate is changing. However, um, notes that we have this current climate of caution in Canada regarding translocation. And I think that climate of caution is still lingering a bit. And I think, you know, we need to think more carefully about using reintroduction and translocation as a recovery tool for plants. It's not going to work for every species, uh, but for the ones that we can propagate successfully and that we can target, you know, good suitable habitat for, uh, it's, it might be a really effective way to actually recover some of these species that we care about a lot. So thank you very much. That's all I had. My contact information is here if you want to get in touch. And thanks again to the NTSC for coordinating all of this. Thank you, Jenny. Um, is Nina speaking too, or is that? Yeah, Nina's here in case anyone has questions, questions? especially okay. about the propagation, which okay. cool. she, was the, she was the leader on. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to take a five minute bio break. Um, and if you can all be back here in 344. Um, and then we'll get to the question and answers. And thank you guys so much for staying with us through all of the technical difficulties. Talk to you in about five. Yeah. And Jenny, I was really happy that you spoke to the fact that it took you over a year for your permits um, because um, some provinces are quicker. Um, if you can establish a, a relationship with the permitting people, a lot of times that helps. Um, I know with like uh, I worked with Claire um, in Nova Scotia on, on getting permits when I was working for the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, and I really believe our relationship with um, the province of Nova Scotia really helped us in um, getting our permits through. Um, they were really great about things. And we have sort of a 30 day turnaround that we try to work to in Nova Scotia for our permits and um, I, I can't think of any examples where they took a year. <laughs> not recently anyway um so yeah we do recognize that you know people are, are waiting for those in order to do their work and we we try to turn them around as efficiently as we can uh we do we, we need some lead time like we tend to get a glut of permit applications at particular times of year and it does take time for us to go through and you know read them and evaluate them and if there are things we're not sure about we refer back to our recovery team sort of advisory groups um to help us make decisions so you know there is a bit of a process involved but um yeah we do our best to move it along as efficiently as we can for sure yeah i can say like um last summer uh last fall um i didn't know that newfoundland ha had the black ash also um on their protected species list as well. And when we were going out to do some seed collection, I brought the province in anyway, just because I wanted to make sure that they were involved. And then they got their nose out of joint because they said I brought them in at the last minute, but I had no idea. Um, so I profusely apologized to the province because, I mean, I should have done my homework before I did all of that. Um, and I should have reached out sooner, but I didn't. And so I, um, you know, Beg, beg their forgiveness and then we started working a lot closer and they were actually able to get our permit done a lot quicker than um, I think it was about three months maybe it was less than that to get it out the door um, so I'm grateful that they were there and they worked with us to do that so yeah yes it was a record <laughs> so anyway um we're almost, we're there now, we're at 344. Um, um, Natalie, did you wanna say any last things before um, we get to our question and answers? Yeah, sure, I just wanted to make sure- You can sure always do this again. Up there. <laughs> and I'll provide my presentation so people can see the, the full thing. But a lot of the work that we do is very collaborative and it wouldn't be possible without like all the different partners like the province of BC, White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada, which is a nonprofit, um, a few different groups um, like the National Tree Seed Center and then the BC Tree Seed Center. So we, we end up sending our seeds to all these different places and that's pretty integral in our restoration work because if we don't have the capacity within parks right now to store seeds, um, but obviously we need them to submit them to rest screening trials, but we also need to 
grow them out um, to nurseries and they have to go somewhere in the interim um, before that happens. So there's some pretty big um, collaborative networks that go together and passionate people that really care about these ecosystems because like Dan and a few others mentioned, um, these trees aren't just individual species. They, they really create an ecosystem that a lot of other plants and animals rely on. And um, so it's, and same, same with us, like as a Parks Canada organization, we're not operating all by ourselves. And then Mary had asked me to touch on permitting. So because we are federal land and the Species at Risk Act applies, um, we have to permit any collection. So even if we're not destroying seed, even if we're just climbing up the trees to get those cones, uh, we need a, a permit. And so we get that permit under a research and collection permit for Parks Canada. So external researchers and folks doing conservation work that want to work on parks lands, they can also apply for this. So, you know, Dave Colatello, the National Tree Seed Center, um, has a permit with us that we can go out and find rare or um, species at risk. And, and we can collect those seeds, send them back to the Tree Seed Center and use them for uh, conservation work. So you can get a permit for restoration conservation. There's also species at risk permitting for public safety issues. So a lot of our highways go through avalanche terrain and they have to do avalanche control, um, like bombing to bring down the snow to make the highways safe. Um, so any white bark pine or species at risk in those areas, there's an exemption for that as well. And that's under section 83. So there's a few different permitting processes, um, but we, we do try and help people through it. Hopefully it won't take a year, but it usually does take a couple months if you're applying for a research and collection permit within parks. Sweet. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, Lucy, do you want to take over the question and answer period now? Sure. So we do have our panelists ready to answer your burning questions. So um, if uh, there's Pam there, perfect. Um, what I'll do is I uh, will go in the q and A. Also, if you want to raise your hand and ask your question uh, live, you're welcome to and put your camera on if you wish. And uh, we'll try to make maybe keep the answers brief. Uh, we only have about 10 to 12 minutes here. So why don't I start with the Q&A and uh, go from there? So my first question is from Matt. Uh, to what degree are these conservation efforts co-developed with Indigenous communities? And what do that involvement look like with the NTSC? Yeah. Uh, so recently we've had the uh, Indigenous Collection, uh, Sea Collection Program, and we're doing a lot of outreach and uh, education with different communities across Canada. Uh, Canada or Donnie did a trip across Canada last summer and visited, I don't know the specifics, but th I think it was 30 some odd communities. Um, and we've been having communities come to us or community members come to us for training in, in tree seed. And, and it's been really great. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, historically, we probably didn't have enough involvement, but I think um, hopefully we're making up for it now. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. How long, Sam, we'll, we'll keep up with you, Matt, here. Uh, how long a seed can survive in cryo storage? Yeah, so theoretically, um, at those temperatures of minus 196 degrees Celsius, um, it should be stopping all biological processes that would, you know, cause aging a seed. But it, you know, it's been used for a while now in, in animals and human tissues, but it's really somewhat new in plant in the plant world. And so we don't really have the data to prove that it can last, you know, forever. But uh, that's, that's the idea. It, sh it should last much longer than than at minus 20. Okay, Natalie, uh, can you tell us more about the pheromone packets you're using? For sure. So those are the packets that we staple on our high value trees that might have genetic resistance to rest. And we, we use them to prevent mountain pine beetle. So we use two different ones, green leaf volatiles, which we call GLV and bourbonone. And green leaf volatiles tricks beetles into thinking that it's a deciduous tree where it's actually a evergreen pine tree. And then the bourbonone um, is anti-aggregating pheromone. So it tells the beetles that that tree has already been attacked. It's full so the beetle should go elsewhere. So it's kind of, it mimics the natural process for pine beetles. And it doesn't work on a forest scale. Like if you had a mountain um, pine beetle infestation on like a large area of the landscape, it's, it'd be hard to protect a whole forest, but it does work very effectively on individual trees. We have a question for Mary. 
What is the access like in BC to Indigenous seed supply, and is it only for trees or for all plants? What is the best, what is the demographic breakdown of Indigenous, non-Indigenous communities, academia, and industry for seed requests? I don't have the answer for all of that. Um, it isn't for just for trees. Um, it, it's being guided by the Indigenous communities. Um, so the Indigenous communities would be the ones kind of guiding us on what species they want us to um, work with them on um, seed um, collections and storage and processing. Um, so we're trying to be as inclusive as we can uh, in regards to their needs. Um, I am not really familiar with the BC um, Indigenous seed supplies. Uh, we're working with um, um, twin sisters um, and, um, oh, look at that, um, ASCII, there we go, who are working together in regards to some of those kind of um, seed supplies. Um, but I'm not, I'm not familiar enough to be able to speak to that. I can ask and reach out to some of the people to kind of get some information. Um, I can give you my email address um, to kind of follow up with you at a later date, if that's okay. Thank you, Mary. So I'm not sure who with this, who will respond. Uh, regarding scouting and SDMs, how do you ensure data sovereignty autonomy, specifically for indigenous culturally significant species to avoid biopiracy and over harvesting? Probably that was for me talking about SDMs. So using SDMs to target places to look for undiscovered populations. And yeah, that is a, a thing to worry about is, you know, is things like wild ginseng, for example, that are, you know, could be poached if anyone knows about them. Um, so my policy was we, we focused a lot on privately held land. So like private landowners and farmers, because we figured those were the least well surveyed. And for landowners who were interested, we gave them a list of everything. So we, we did a full plant community survey on a one hectare area of their forest. And if they were interested, we'd send them a list saying, these are the things you have. Um, and then we would submit um, new records of tract species to the Natural Heritage Information Center of the, of the province, but um, definitely not publicize <laughs> this in any way else, you know, so. Uh, the province has rules that the if they share data with they did which they did with with me to to build these uh, species distribution models, we have to you know make a commitment not to like pinpoint on maps publicly where some of those populations are. Um, I don't know if that fully answers the question. Thank you. Uh, from Noel Walsh in the chat here, do we? need permits to collect any tree seeds. Our group is going to collect yellow birch seeds because so few are left in our area of Quebec. We plant microforests in our regions. Anybody want to take that one? I think it all depends on um, the type of species or the type of tree. Um, it depends on which province you're in. Um, the first thing you should probably do is going to look at your provincial um, species at risk um, website to find out which species are actually listed in the province. Um, because if it's listed on the provincial list, then you'll have to go and look for um, um, access to getting a permit through the provincial process. Um, and there's um, SARA registry online that you can go to um, to be able to find out if it's federally listed. If it's federally listed, then um, you can reach out to your local uh, or your provincial's um, um, Canadian Wildlife Service um, office to find out who and you need to speak to and how to proceed on um, getting a uh, federal permit to, um, for those species that may be listed federally. Thank you. I'll go back into the Q&A and I apologize if I mispronounce some of the words. A uh, question for Natalie. Are there any general uh, trichoderma or biocontrol products that are being used to preventatively treat these species at risk for fungal infections? 
Yeah, so that's a really great question. The way that this um, white pine blister rust infects the trees is actually through the needles. It requires an alternate host, so it doesn't stay in the soil. It goes between rivies, so like black currant type plants and a few alternate hosts. And it has a life cycle there and then it goes back into the pine trees and it actually um, comes in through the pine needle. So the bigger the tree, the more the foliage, the more susceptible it is to these little spores that come down. So it doesn't actually live in the soil. Um, so any of the, the control agents in the soil wouldn't work as well. But there is some research. Um, Dr. Jurgen Elton is looking at some different natural products to try and treat um, seeds and seedlings to see if it benefits them or not. Um, but it's not necessarily to treat the blister rust itself. It's a bit of a different pathogen. So I hope that answers your question. Another one, Matt, do you use beneficial fungal, fungal uh, bioinoculants like trichoma based products to help prime young trees as they get sent back to the landscape? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's probably a better question for our growing uh, people at the greenhouse. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about butternut, um, I know that butternut has been difficult to grow from the nut because of the, the OCJ pathogen being contaminated. Um, the procedure that uh, Tannis and Martin developed with the in vitro deronation kind of sort of prevents that. And so we don't really get any contamination from the OCJ um, because there's it's just the embryo and then that's uh, sanitized in bleach before being grown in vitro. Um, other than that, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Question for Jenny. How are you planning to disentangle plant survivorship from site suitability in your plantings? Uh, okay, so the idea is we we plant, we planted in this kind of a range of suitabilities. So we didn't plant in like this has like zero chance, <laughs> like 0% habitat suitability, but we've chose sites that low, medium, or high. And the thing that we wanna know is, do we have higher survival, higher uh, growth, greater reproduction in the high suitability sites? Um, we're also looking at microclimate factors. So within that one hectare site, it might be more important, you know, did we plant these plants? down by the stream where the soil is a bit moister as opposed to up high. So we hope that we can um, we can test the relative influence of those different things. In addition to um, with the wood poppies, we did half of the plants kind of with a little fence around them, hopefully to deter herbivores. So we can look at that response too. A bit broader than the scope here, but something I'm wondering was has to do with manipulated manipulated population in the context of indigenous managed landscape. And is the, is the exclusion of manipulated cultivated plants a continuation of colonial nature viewpoint? I can I can start that one since I brought up manipulated populations? I think the answer is yes. I mean, we it's the same as with, you know, wilderness areas in Canada that there's sort of the long assumption that these are unpeopled, unmanaged areas. And uh, we know that, you know, a large part of Canada was managed and stewarded by Indigenous peoples. And, and generally, Indigenous land use practices increase the diversity of plants. I think of Ontario, some of these black oak ecosystems that you can find across Southern Ontario. Um, indigenous land practices absolutely increase the, the diversity and the abundance of, of plants. Uh, and I find that kind of inspiring because, you know, it means that maybe we can do the same thing where, where we live. Um, Jenny kind of touched on sort of like how conservative we are to move plants around. I think that is kind of the mindset that like, you know, we're messing with like wild, untouched nature. And, and we, that's a myth. And we, we do need to break that down. And, you know, we certainly don't want to go willy nilly planting species at risk everywhere. But I think that the, the, the model where we see ourselves as an agent of biodiversity and increasing the, the distribution and the abundance of these plants is kind of going back to indigenous practices. And I think that that's kind of inspiring in terms of putting ourselves into the conservation picture and, and our, native, our native plants will do much better. And you know, I am so puzzled, like game species, we 
absolutely just put them everywhere we don't need research or professors right we'll just you know put like bison in newfoundland like 40 years ago like we just kind of do it and you know so maybe it's you know it is partly maybe just kind of getting over that that hump of you know we, we should do a little bit more experimentation and kind of look to other countries like jenny pointed out but it is absolutely what we need to do more of because we're not going to change the status of species if there isn't more of them or if they don't have bigger ranges yeah i think Dan, an interesting point that, if i can speak to that jenny real quick is that bc has um, a climate-based seed transfer system now. So they used to go based on geographic ranges for different tree species in terms of the planting guidelines of where you could put which species. But now it's switched completely to a climate-based seed transfer. So now people are able to plant under the Forest and Range Practices Act way further than they used to be, and it's all based on. Oh. Yeah, the other thing I was I was just going to add is um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which, which is really famous now and everyone loves. She talks about a, you know, a, a forest across the fence from her that used to be agriculture and no longer has wild leeks. And she talks about it being her responsibility to help these plants get back over the fence and into this recovering forest. And I, I really like that as opposed to, no, no, we can't, we can't touch anything. Okay, I'm not sure if we lost um, <laughs> Lucy again. Um, so um, I think- I'm not sure all... either if I'm here. Am I here? Oh, there you are. There you are. Everything is very unstable today. <laughs> I <promise laughs> Well, I think we're right on time. Um, if there's anybody has like one last burning question for our panelists, we can probably cover just one last one. Maybe speak up or the Q&A, we've covered everything in the Q&A. If you, yeah, if you would like to ask us in person, we can make sure that you have the ability to ask us in person. Put your hand up and uh, we'll go get right to you. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, well, I think maybe everybody has, uh, is good for today and I just want to thank you uh, all the panelists for coming today but much appreciated your time and your expertise and sharing with the with our participants um I think everybody <laughs> I'm gonna put Donnie on the spot here <laughs> oh he just hid <laughs> thank you Melissa for organizing this webinar um we will follow up with an email and uh with some of the answers to the question that Melissa has really covered um, oh. Somebody has their hand up. Go Melissa ahead. did. Melissa, did you um, want to say something? I was just clapping. <laughs> oh, that was your hand up. That wasn't a clap. Yeah. I'm <laughs> clapping. Thank you all. All right, we're going to wrap up today. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest Thanks of your off. day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Claire.